Are your existing solutions able to take advantage of real threat intelligence? Common solutions like firewalls weren't designed to handle the massive and growing volume of threat indicators. This challenge often results in significant gaps in your protections, even when you think you have it covered. You need to protect yourself by filtering network traffic against unique threat indicators in a way that allows you to act. Palawall by Bandora Systems is the solution that filters over 10 million indicators right out of the box. Developed in partnership with the Department of Defense, Palawall is affordable for companies of all sizes. Get your free trial today at bandorasystems.com. Rapid7 powers the practice of SecOps. Using shared data, analytics, and automated workflows, SecOps unites IT, DevOps, and security teams to make security an outcome of innovation. Rapid7 combines technology, expertise, and advocacy to drive vulnerability management, application security, incident detection, and log management for more than 7,000 organizations worldwide. Power up your SecOps practice with a free trial at rapid7.com forward slash security weekly. Skeleton Keys, Golden Tickets, Forged Packs, DC Sync, DC Shadow. The Active Directory attack surface is expanding faster than admins can keep up with. Securing your environment begins with implementing least privileged administrative models, but does not end there. Many organizations send Active Directory syslog events to a SIM platform. However, logs are noisy, of limited scope, and are time-consuming to review and act upon. Active Directory is secure when it's clean, understood, configured properly, monitored closely, and controlled tightly. Stealth Bits technology Technologies provide solutions that monitor, secure, and detect the latest threats against Active Directory. Visit them today at stealthbits.com to learn more. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this special segment on Business Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, and I'm here with Katie Stebbins. I said that right? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, she is the Vice President for Economic Development for the University of Massachusetts. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks now, uh, when we think of UMass, uh, I was just thinking while we were waiting to come on this segment, I've g gone to UMass Dartmouth back in the day when I used to work for Brown University. There's yep. multiple, those are all still affiliated like with UMass, correct? Yeah, the University of Massachusetts is a five campus system. Mm -hmm. So we have Amherst, we have uh, uh, Worcester, which is our medical school. Mm -hmm. We have UMass Lowell, we have UMass Boston, and we have UMass Dartmouth. It was UMass Amherst. That was the one. Amherst. I'm an alum Amherst. of Amherst. Yeah, okay. it's out that was in Western like Mass. Far out. Yeah, in Western Mass. Yeah, Amherst. Amherst. You okay. Drop the age. I've been there. It's like you. That's drive... how we know you're from Boston exactly. if you say Amherst. <laughs> yeah. But like I drove through and there was like nothing, and all of a sudden there was a college campus. There's like this thirty thousand oh. student campus. Definitely yeah. the one comes that comes up I'd... out of a cornfield. There yeah. was someone <laughs> that I used to work with in the university side that went there. His name was Chris something. Because there's, there's only it's three Chris's, so right. I should know who that <laughs> is. <laughs> anyway, I have fond memories of when I worked in the university uh, security uh, scene. That's so, great. Yeah. That's great. Um, so when, I, I guess let's talk a little bit about your background first. Yeah. Um, so how did you come to be the uh, vice president for economic development? Uh, so my, I'm, my background's in economic development. I've been doing economic development for the past 20 years in cities uh, and a few years ago, Governor Baker of Massachusetts got elected governor, and I was really lucky to be asked to be the head of technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship mm -hmm. for the state of Massachusetts. Mm. Um, this is because I've been doing a lot of different work out in Western Mass around uh, innovation in low-income neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we make sure everything doesn't look like Kendall Square, but how do we democratize innovation? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we make sure that everybody has an opportunity to partake in the innovation economy and the tech economy? So, you know, luckily I impressed some people who were around Governor Baker and mm -hmm. got asked to work uh, in Boston. So we made the leap from Western Mass to Boston. And one of the things Governor Baker had asked me to do early on was convene the cybersecurity cluster on his behalf. And he really wanted to get a sense of what is it, where are the opportunities, who are the leaders, and how can the state of Massachusetts um, play a role in strengthening that ecosystem so that we can make it a competitive part of our economy. Uh, I was doing this also with digital healthcare and a few other different areas. Um, I gotta tell you that like the cybersecurity community is such a fun community. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's not lost on you. You know this. <laughs> um, and so it was just a great opportunity to convene CEOs and leaders and government officials and university officials. Um, we went over to Israel and got to do a cybersecurity mission with the governor over there. Um, so really got into it. And as I was working with all these CEOs, they were especially in cyber, they said, look, we can expand our companies as fast as you can get us talent. Right. And I kept looking around and I kept seeing these private universities and, you know, they're challenged with getting their alums to stay. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not from here. They're not going to, about 8 to 12% of their alums will stay. And they're smaller schools to begin with. I said, well, that's not going to solve the problem. 
you know, and I looked at UMass, and you've got nearly 75,000 students across five campuses. They retain graduates at, you know, 60 plus percent. I was going to say that uh, do a lot of uh, students that go to yeah. UMass in particular, right? Exactly. They stay in Boston because there's they so many do. technology companies there. Exactly. They do. They, mm -hmm. they traditionally, you know, New Englanders, we, we have a culture we like, right? Sure. So you go to school here. A lot of our students stay here and become leaders here. And so I said, God, that's, that's where we need to be focusing. So... It was a great opportunity. Uh, President Meehan went on the Israel mission with us, mm -hmm. and I got to know him. And it just kind of one thing led to another, just saying, you know, I really want to work on workforce development in these industries, and I really want UMass to be a prominent part of how we're doing this and play a leadership role in it. And so I matriculated over. I, 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 I walked away from this job that I absolutely adored with mm -hmm. Governor Baker. I created that position. It was just my heart and soul. Um, but workforce is really important to me. And I felt like if I'm going to spend my time doing something that's impactful, I've got to go where this makes sense. And it just made sense to go to the president's office at UMass and mm -hmm. work on this on behalf of all five campuses. Is the, the shortage of talented workers solely in engineering or is it more like pronounced in cybersecurity and, and why is that? You know, you could talk to any industry leader and they're going to tell you they have a shortage yeah. in their thing. So life science is going to tell you we can't get enough people to do what they're doing manufacturing has been mm -hmm. saying it for years. You could go out to a tourism area and they're going to tell you they can't get enough chefs, mm -hmm. you know? And so we have a labor shortage in general, you know, we're at full employment. We're doing really well. Um, and what's interesting is now you're watching different industries sort of fight for the attention of people who are either new into the workforce or people who are already in the workforce saying, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's, you know, that's a little bit, that's a little bit new and it's exciting. Um, but the shortages are, are widespread in a lot of different places. Right. There's um, always a conversation around the mismatch of male to female ratio in cybersecurity. Why is that and what, what can we do to help? Um, you know, I think that the, the tech conversation, the, the gender differences in tech in general. And that's in tech in general, it's right? It's tech Not in general. Yeah. And, it's a, and it's a hot talk conversation for sure. I think when we talk about cybersecurity, what's interesting is we talk a lot about the red teams. We talk about mm -hmm. the attacker side. Um, and I think that attracts a lot of males into cybersecurity. I haven't done any research on this, but I have my own personal thoughts because I have two daughters around the fact that if we talked about the blue team a little more, we talked mm -hmm. about the defender side. Uh, I think you may see more women mm -hmm. really being interested in that. So I think a little bit is how we pitch it, how sure. we talk about it. But we're in, the, we're in inning one, mm -hmm. right, um, of how we talk about cybersecurity, how we start talking about kids about it how we start to get people interested in this field. This is still relatively new in terms of this, you know, giant demand. But I do think we need to think carefully about the things that would get girls and women um, to want to come over and work in the cybersecurity field. And I think the Defender, the Blue Team pieces are part of that. I think women who are in like, um, like female bank tellers, you know, women who are in jobs where you're, you're having to pay attention to detail, mm -hmm. They have some adjacency skills that we should be going after and talking to women are more patient. Uh, I know from working in manufacturing for a long time, I have people in manufacturing say to me that uh, women on quality control mm -hmm. are better on the front lines because they just, they're more patient, they have more attention to detail. Um, there's things there that are adjacencies to cybersecurity that we should be paying attention to. Yeah, it's interesting. I, ha I have three boys at home and every day this summer when I get home, like something was broken. Like my hope is just, it's nothing that can't be easily replaced or isn't too expensive. Right. And I, and I don't know if that's a, a true, you know, obviously it's not true for all, you know, uh, male and female. Right. Yeah, we're making roles. gross generalizations. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the boys in general like to break stuff. Right. And yeah. I think that when you do penetration testing or assessments, I mean, you're, you're breaking things. Yeah. Right. What, and I think that's been kind of the like staple to cybersecurity for some time is yeah. like, hey, you can be a really cool hacker and break into stuff. And once you've done that, with my background in penetration testing, I'm like, okay, but the more challenging issues I think that we have are how do I defend against that? And, yeah. and so much so that a, a lot of us, myself included, have been focusing more on the blue team aspect because mm. I, I think there's a lot more work to be done, more so than when I talk to my pen tester friends, they're like, yeah, 
pretty much can always get in. <laughs> and you have to know how to do both. Of sure, course. And it, absolutely. And but it's about so yes, you have to know how to do both. And uh, and most people I talk to argue that you need to know how to do the pen testing first. Mm -hmm. But it's about what are we using to attract people in? Yes. What is the long term view of their career identity that we're using to draw people? And my daughter, my thirteen year old, will tell you she wants to join the Navy and she mm -hmm. wants to be a general and she wants to be on a cyber team. Mm. and she wants to defend our country. Right. And that's what draws her to cybersecurity. And she's 13 years old, and she just feels this at a gut level, you yeah. know. Um, so anyway. It's all, I, I think it's a different way of contributing and helping, right? Like certainly on the yeah. attack side, you're helping by pointing out flaws, but on the defensive side, you're actually protecting against right. them. So I think and you're right. The, the message probably needs to change. Right. Well, the most the jobs that are open, if you're going to financial services, you're going to these big companies, they're looking for blue team people. Mm -hmm. um, and so we also have to be clear about where the jobs are. You know, we've been doing some analysis around what the programs are training for in higher ed and where the jobs are. There's a mismatch there. Sure. You know, 80% of the programs in the schools are focused on red team and, you know, if 80% of the jobs are on blue team, yeah, we've, we've yeah. done something backwards. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity for a dialogue here um, to be doing this a little smarter and to matching up the analytics a little better. I, I have some of these debates with folks sometimes about when we should introduce engineering concepts such as programming mm. into the school system. Now, I, I'm biased. I learned programming when I was seven because my parents sent me to class and I was like, wow, I really, I really like that. But not everyone agrees that that's where you should start. Do you yeah. think that some of the problems we have with the mixed match workforce could be solved by introducing some of the engineering in, in earlier in the... Yeah. I mean, you know, it's really interesting. When I, was, when I was a kid, my brother's two years younger than me, and my family brought home a Radio Shack Trash 80 computer, mm -hmm. right? like one of the first ones. And my brother was told, like, you know, go write programs, go do mm -hmm. stuff. Like, it was his, right? You know, and Katie, go and figure out how to get a sports scholarship or something right. and you know my brother's in tech my brother's mm -hmm. a network administrator and i'm a politician <laughs> <laughs> so like um but at the same time i'm a citizen scientist like i've had such a passion for tech and for science my whole life but i've taught it to myself so you know to your point i think we do need to be thinking about exposure more you know my two brothers who are both in network it mm -hmm. you know they approached computers like something that they weren't afraid to break mm -hmm. they weren't afraid of this thing they just kind of went after it and recoded it and hacked away at it my sisters and i i think approached it much more like it's this thing that our parents bought us and it's expensive and we can't it. harm it yeah. don't break it so i just think from we just have a gender difference in how we approach technology mm -hmm. um so we do need to get girls more comfortable with breaking it and how do you put it back together? And right. what does that mean? And that kind of stuff we can do earlier. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you know, I meet people who are not engineers, not computer science engineers, and are liberal arts majors who ended up thriving in a cybersecurity mm -hmm. uh, environment because they had other life skills that they brought into it. And then they sure. could easily get trained uh, into it. My sister is an art major, and she now does data analytics for a digital health company, mm -hmm. you know. This, it wasn't what she was trained in, but she had all those life skills that, that put her in this. So uh, I think we need to be open-minded. Just like, you know, the, if your toaster doesn't work anymore, tell your daughter to go take it apart and put it right. back together. Like, not plugged in. Right. You know, like, <laughs> Safety precautions, yes. Yeah, I think we just, I think we have to be a little more aggressive about telling our daughters, it's okay to break things. It's okay to explore things. It's okay to get messy and dirty. And mm -hmm. I'm always telling my girls, like, jump off something. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay Takes to get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, is the Cyber Patriot program in Massachusetts and something that you've, you've worked with before? I haven't worked with it. And so um, I know that there's a history. I only know tangentially that there's a history there, but um, I haven't worked with it. And, you know, finding new ways and new programs and, and more broadly engaging, you know, our kids in these programs is something I think we need to do. I think UMass Boston at one point ran a Governor's Cup challenge. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we and they don't anymore. And so it's, you know, how do we start to bring some of these things back? Um, this cyber education training consortium that we formed mm -hmm. is great because we have 40 of these universities and colleges that are doing cybersecurity degrees and certificates talking about that. You know, how do we collectively talk to the K through 12 population? Just like we have all these robotics teams now, how do we do a better job sponsoring cyber teams uh, and doing a lot more work with them? Right. Is that how you're essentially like building your pipeline into these various universities is with programs in K through 12? 
Um, it's not. You know, the, the conversation with the universities was more, look, if Massachusetts, I mean, I know we're sitting in Rhode Island right now, but, you know, we have close partnerships with sure. Rhode Island. Um, but, you know, Massachusetts is a leading technology state in the country right now. Uh, we got there by being really competitive at mm -hmm. what we do in tech. Cybersecurity is no different. Uh, in Massachusetts, we want to play a leadership role nationally. And to play a leadership role nationally, your talent has to be world class. To do that, there's not one university or college could do it on their own. Harvard can't do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. Northeastern, MIT, they can't do it alone. UMass can't do it alone. And I said, you know, I think all of us need to come together and say, how do we build the best talent pipeline system in the world, utilizing all 40 of us? Looking at the pathways, a, a colleague of mine from Northeastern said, we've got platinum titanium coated pipes in this system, right? But they're broken. Mm -hmm. They don't connect. If we connected them all up, it'd be incredible. Uh, and so we're trying to do this not only because we want Massachusetts to be competitive, but we want it to be a model for other states in the country who mm -hmm. could take advantage of this too. Higher ed generally has a hard time collaborating, especially among private to public to community college. Uh, and we're trying to model that. So everyone came to the table as saying, look, you." Each of us can't do this alone. Let's do it together, and then let's be the best. And then that will attract more students overall to, the, mm -hmm. to all of us. Um, that will attract more companies to want to do reskilling and retraining at all of our institutions. So I think we, it was just a good message of we can be better together than we can be separately. And people have been pretty bought into that. How do you blend certifications into the mix between you know, what you learn in school, whether that's the high school or college or whatever, master's degree, Versus the professional certifications and how do those how do those play? Yeah, that's a real conversation right now that we're having. Um, the community colleges, especially which offer two year degrees, mm -hmm. they're graduating people in cybersecurity because the industry is saying we need people, we need people, we need people. So, you know, okay, we're doing a two year associates level degree. Go hire these students, and then the industry is saying, well, they don't have certifications, they mm -hmm. don't have five years experience, can't hire them. We're like, well, wait a minute. I thought you said you'd take anybody if they just had some level of you know right. basic awareness. So, and this has also happened at the bachelor's level, and I, there's a woman I'm working with right now, she has a master's degree, and she has five years experience, and she doesn't have certifications, mm -hmm. and she can't get hired. Mm -hmm. So, the certification question is an interesting one, right? And how do you weave it into curriculum? How do you do this micro-credentialing and certifications um, on top of a bachelor's or master's degree? How do you do it through continuing ed? You know, so the other piece is maybe it's not through a traditional pathway. Um, maybe yeah, it's some it's, partnership or something. There's a, a community college that here where you take courses in networking and you get a Cisco yeah. certification, and that's that's pretty common. I don't know how common it is in Massachusetts. It, it is common. It's just the cost, you yeah. know. So if you're pursuing your bachelor's degree, you're focusing all of your money on a bachelor's degree because it, we've told everyone they need a four-year degree, mm -hmm. or you're getting your master's degree because you're like, well, I have a master's in security administration. That must be great. And then you find out you have to pay more money to get more certificates. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you feel like you're, this is where the industry is going to have to play a role, I think. We've got to realize that there's really highly qualified individuals with a lot of potential to have long careers in this industry. But the cost of education in this country is getting really prohibitive for people mm -hmm. to go back and take classes that could be anywhere from 2000 to $15,000, right? Um, how does industry identify some of these really great people and say, look, in exchange for you coming to work for me for five years, I'll pay for your certifications and your credentialing. I, I think we're going to have to be doing that kind yeah, of work I, in I order for that. this to happen. Yeah. And if organizations that have done that, I think, have been very successful, yeah. you know, taking into account that the program is built correctly. But yeah. if it is, I think that's, that's important. Yeah, and I sure. think it's, it's still just at a scale that's too small. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the industry, the security industry can't, Remember, it's not just the cybersecurity companies. It's it's a state street bank. It's hospitals. It's yeah. everybody. Pharmaceuticals, which are big in Massachusetts, too. Life sciences, right. Yep. It's it's enormous. And so if we're going to meet this really massive growing demand, um, everyone's going to have to put some money into their budgets for certifications for employees. Because, you know, in all my meetings, it's interesting. I'll have half the room saying, I don't need somebody with certifications. I just need someone with talent. And the other half of the room will say, I'm not, HR won't even look at them without certifications. I'm not even bringing them in the door. And so there's not even consensus in a yeah, room yeah. as to what we need to be doing. And it's yet. frustrating too, you know, because what, what more senior security people like myself will say is, you know, degrees, great, certifications, great, experience, that's really important. But uh, it's a, like, go off on a point you said, like you can go get your bachelor's and you're paying money to get that. And then you're going to go get some certification. But oh, by the way, to get experience, we'll say 
but you really got to like work at a help desk. And you're like, well, hold on, hold on, wait a minute. I just paid all that money for a four year school right. and all those money for certifications in the minimum entry job I can get now is at a help desk where the pay scale is much lower oh than gosh. if you were some kind yeah. of security engineer, architect, you know, security analyst or whatever. That's and right. that I think is a, a pretty big problem. That's right. It is a problem. And especially if you feel like you're coming in, you're taking a help desk job and that employer is not sitting with you and saying, here's a pathway to yeah. where you want to get. And let's work with you and mentor you and set some goals and get you there. And by mm -hmm. the way, you're going to be making 18 bucks an hour at this help desk, mm -hmm. but we'll pay to send you to all these credentialing classes. And someone might go, that's worth it. Like, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. We're just going to have to have better conversations about that and better solutions. I, I have some encouraging stories for you along these lines. <laughs> uh, one is a student that we met that made sure that his work at the school was in a help desk. And he's like, I know it's not security, which is refreshing to hear from some of the students because a lot of students stay in cybersecurity. Like, yeah, I, I want to go work in security. And I don't want anything to do with anything else. This yeah. student's like, yeah, people bring me their broken laptops or devices and I help them fix them. I'm like, yes, check. I would hire someone just because they've had that experience and took the initiative to say, I have to learn how technology works. And then I also have to learn how to break it and learn how to fix it. That's and right. those are three different three yeah. different skills. So, I mean, that was really encouraging. Do you find that, oh, and the other example was a university, uh, and I forget who it was, they said, you know, the students were graduating and they had no real world experience. And all the corporations were like, yeah, you're giving us these students, but they have no experience. So they built a SOC in the university, partnered with the IT department, and now students that go through the yeah. program spend time in the SOC. Yeah. Those were two things that I thought were, were Yeah, really so that's definitely an increasing trend. I think mm -hmm. you're going to see more and more uh, opportunities for students to work at the SOC that, that runs a university. But remember, a university is only going to have a SOC of a certain size university. It's There's a right. lot it's of schools yeah. that are outsourcing. So, you're, you know, mm -hmm. UMass is a, a massive research institution. It's the second largest employer in the state. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we have a SOC. I think each of our individual campuses have Probably them. have, right, yeah. Um, you know, what do you do when you're a small, you know, like uh, we had Leslie College come to one of our meetings, mm -hmm. very small liberal arts school, yep. right? And so, but on that note, what's interesting is we did have um, the CISOs come to the meeting and they were with the faculty members mm -hmm. and they said, you guys are teaching this in classrooms and you've never had me come talk to your class. Right. We're both working for the same university. I'm technically who's going to employ your classroom, mm -hmm. and how come you aren't asking my opinion? Mm -hmm. And that was a really interesting conversation, trying to pull the two together. Um, so where we can do that, I think we'll, uh, we'll do more of it. We're playing with how at UMass we could take the opportunity around workforce training in ASOC and expand that to other students at mm -hmm. other schools, um, you know, trying to trying to that real world experience is is definitely important my friend andy alice at akamai mm -hmm. uh, he's great about saying that he w hires resource librarians and theater majors and journalists because he's like i need people who have a, just a different take on this yeah. and can solve the problem differently and look through the lens of uh, the situation differently. He's like, in a crisis, I need someone who can speak publicly like a theater major and handle a crowd. Yep. I need journalists who can write the mm -hmm. response and what we're doing. I mean, just, you know, Andy's done a great job thinking about how non-traditional pathway people all need to be part of, you know, response teams and security teams at companies, which is great. And I think there's a intimidation factor that you have to overcome because I think many people that maybe have a dotted line into technology or security are like, well, what you people do is magic. Like it's voodoo. I don't know. I don't know what you do. And it's really, most of us will spend the time and, and help people understand it and realize that their skills are very valuable, even though they don't know how to write a buffer overflow. That's, that's yeah. not, that's something you can learn. It's not right. as important as some of those other skills. Yeah. I about. think, you know, uh, again, we talk about um, people who have been laid off who are bank tellers, mm -hmm. you know, because we have less and less bank tellers. Now right. I just deposited my checks today via phone, yep, right? Yep. I never see a bank teller. But uh, the skills that bank tellers have, there are some adjacencies. Mm -hmm. So again, how can we look at some of these other places where people are being laid off? And how can we have a better conversation with them about this a new career that they could think about? And how do we translate the skills that we need in the cybersecurity field and in that industry to general skills that everybody speaks a common language around? Because mm. um, right now, like you just said, we can get so specific in what you need from a computer science background to be able to work in this. And someone's going to go, I have no idea how to do that. But if you break it down differently, mm -hmm. that are more around just core soft skills and intellectual skills, people go, oh, 
I do that, mm -hmm. you know, or gamify it. You know, how does this person solve problems? You know, I think there's probably ways that, you know, through gamification, we could do analysis on how each individual person, their brain walks through a problem solving set and go, wow, that person's got some aptitude that we should tap into. Um, I think we need to be The military that. Does, does that level, has done that level of testing for some time. Probably. I, I mean, I don't have the military applications at my fingertips, but I don't yeah, doubt I, you. Yeah, yeah, I don't have all the details, but I've spoken yeah. with people that have uh, like applied to various military branches, and there is definitely an aptitude test, I think, for yeah, every branch. Yeah, the ASFAB. I mean, yeah. yeah, so everyone going to the military takes the ASVAB, and it's mm -hmm. got engineering questions on it and different things that does assess your aptitude in different areas, mm. you know, for sure. Um, I think we need to get more sophisticated around it, and I think there's probably a lot of opportunity to do that. But yeah, we need to start talking about these careers as something a little less daunting, mm. um, especially since we know that applications are getting more user friendly. You know, as the user experience of a technician becomes, you know, not so in the guts of everything, but sort right. of more at a surface level, there's a lot more opportunities for people to engage in, you know, more of a uh, pedestrian way. We're democratizing the technology a lot more. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And we have to if we're going to scale up fast. We don't have a choice. Right. You know. Right. Um, with Massachusetts being one of the technology leaders uh, in the world, really, uh, what does the future of security look like? like if we, you had a crystal ball and you had to say, well, you know, I know there's going to be companies that are developing this next generation technology. How does that change the workforce and change our, our perception of it? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, I am not a security technologist myself. I just, you know, play one of the movie mm -hmm. about myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just in the economic development world with a passion for this area. Um, I, I think we're going to see so much more ubiquity. I think we're going to see entry-level workers in everywhere as part of their orientation, on-ramping training, now getting trained in different levels of security. I think it's going to become so much more ubiquitous in our, uh, in our society um, that it's not going to feel like it's over here or over there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just going to feel like a part of everything we do out of necessity. Um, I think there'll just come a time when every employee everywhere um, is going through not just sort of basic, this is how you change your password training, but a little more intense, you know, this is more of a red team, blue team. This is the what these are. This is why we care. Mm -hmm. the, the why we care piece has got to be more widespread and talked about and more transparent in companies. And I think that starts at the onboarding. So I think over time, you will have generations like our kids are young, you know, our 10 year olds, mm -hmm. when they get to the workforce, when they're 25, uh, it's going to be second nature right, um, right. because they will absorb so much more. So I think, um, I think it's, it's going to a place, unlike we were talking about life sciences and biomanufacturing right now. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say to you in 10 years, everyone's going to know how to do biomanufacturing. Right. That's just not going to happen. Um, 10 years from now, though, uh, I think there's just going to be so much more widespread education and knowledge about this field and people having a base level of skills that they probably got in K through 12. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's just not going to seem so foreign. Yeah, it's, uh, one of my friends definitely uh, is of the opinion that a lot of the skills that we train really hard and get certifications for will just become a commodity. Mm. in the future yeah so it's top. definitely echoing your, your sentiments yeah exactly. on top which are yeah. important and everyone needs to be able to specialize i mean i do think as you know as tech becomes more of just an everyday part of who we are and what we do um it it is the specializations on top that differentiate us and we've got to be able to also explain that to students coming up you know you're great at doing x y and z i mean you know i, <laughs> I you know my kids talk about pie hack clubs and stuff at school mm -hmm. and yeah. and i'm not saying mine are in them i'm just <laughs> saying they talk about them and uh this is this is junior high you know right. this is just commonplace yeah how does uh each person that's going through the school system and, and want a career how do you build your own pathways into cybersecurity? because there's multiple kind of ways into our industry and certainly the number of different jobs in cybersecurity is very different uh, yeah. from job to job, right? Like a malware reverse engineer, very different from maybe a pen tester, very different from someone on the blue team, very different from an auditing or third-party risk assessment. Yeah. How do you build your own path? Yeah, you know, I really think that students are going to go through four-year school doing something. They should be going and doing something that speaks to them. Yeah. They, students have to start going to school for something that engages them, right? It can't be a four-year booze cruise. Mm -hmm. It can't be four years of what your mom and dad told you to do. We've got to start using these four years to really build soft skills, to learn how to work in team environments, to learn how to survive, you mm -hmm. know, those kind of things. 
Um, and then I think people need to go get a job and they need to experience jobs um, and they need to start building some life skills. I think that cybersecurity and, and already the conversations I have, they, the companies tell me I don't want the 21 year old who just graduated. I actually want the 30 to 40 year old who's got some experience. Mm -hmm. And as you said earlier, the student who maybe was taking apart computers and putting them back together, it wasn't they were directly experiencing this, but they were doing some things that, that are show me that that person's got some critical thinking skills. Um, and so there are some students who say that's my, you know, that's my pathway. Yeah. But I think people come to it more as I'm in this company, I've been given progressively more responsible opportunities. And maybe the CISO comes to them and says, hey, you know, you're really good at X, Y, and Z. Have you thought about doing this? I'd love to send you some certifications and try you over on this team. I actually think for security, that's where we're going to get the bulk of the talent is um, at any workplace, people who understand who they need pulling yeah, internally. Can go find people. Internally yeah. and, and certifying. And I still, you know, people who are going through higher ed, there's always going to be that that pipeline. But um, they need to do they need to do them. They need to go find their path. Well, and that helps. I mean, you're going to go pluck people that you think have the skills, right? Rather than the student, like I graduate from school and I go try what I think I want to do and that's not it. And then they go try something else. There's probably a lot of jobs that I would really hate doing. And I hate to see people try all of those before they find something where right. they could have a mentor come and say, I think you're good at this. I, I think of my wife yeah. uh, who's x-ray and ultrasound. And she describes her first experiences in ultrasound and she goes into a hospital and starts doing exams. Like, there was a lot of people that probably dropped out after those right. initial, like, really invasive kind of procedures. Like, yeah. you have to be comfortable with that. Sometimes you don't know until you try it. Right. Um, and so. I had no idea I was going to like the tech world. You know, mm -hmm. I'm trained as an environmental planner. Mm -hmm. You know, I came at this because I thought sensor technology and how it monitors the environment is really cool. And mm -hmm. you start to love sensor technology, you start to discover all these other things, including sure. security. Um, and so... I'll have to tell you about my humidors and how I monitor those <laughs> later. I, I would love to know that. Um, and so, so I'm not saying, I mean, obviously I'm in higher ed. I'm not saying that higher ed shouldn't be playing a significant role mm -hmm. in training people for this field. I absolutely think that they should. I think that because the demand's so strong, um, I think we just need to be thinking much more broadly about how we're approaching this. I think we also have to be honest about the fact that our population is decreasing. The number of 18 year olds over the next 10 years mm -hmm. is gonna be decreasing. Mm -hmm. The bulk of where we're gonna be getting our talent, just writ large, is going to be, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. You've got the people just behind me who are like Gen Y, if we still talk about Gen Y, but you know, the, in between millennials and Xers, there's mm -hmm. the Ys. Um, you know, how, maybe they're miserable in what they chose. You know, they did go to school for what their parents told them to do. They hated it. Mm -hmm. And now they're like, that was horrible. And now I'm career mismatched and I got to do something else. And, you know, I just wish we could set up huge job fairs for people who are like, my job sucks and I hate my career. And right. just talk to me about what else there is in this world. Yeah. We don't have career fairs that safely let people be like, I don't know. I just want to like try on that outfit for a day and yeah, see what exactly. it feels like. Right. And um, I think security especially is one of those areas where we could have a big costume show and figure that out. So if there are uh, CISOs and senior executives in security today, what advice do you have for them to help find talent maybe within their organization or outside that can really be beneficial to cybersecurity today? Um, so I think it's a few levels. I think that um, any company needs to be aggressive about offering incentives to bring people in and the, for the right people, certifications, credentialing. It means you might have to hold more social events or more get to know you events or something where you're you're just having exposure to a greater critical mass of people. Um, Cause that's always the trick, right? We're busy. Mm. Um, you know, I don't have time to sit in a room with 500 young people or middle-aged people and see what their hopes and dreams are. Like, so we've got to figure out how we, how we create a broader exposure point um, and to increase the funnel. Yeah. Um, that's the trick right now. How do we increase the funnel of interest so that it's not here, but it's here and we're just putting more people in it. Um, but it I happens by accident. So it I happens mean, by accident. I see people all the time and I'm like, you'd be awesome in cybersecurity. I'm right. Like, and y it's, it's hard. Sometimes I struggle with, how do I know that? Like, I don't but know. You There's just, just know. You just know. You just like, know. I know people who'd be good at politics and people yep. who'd be good at economic development. Um, but we still have to set the intention. If you don't is say, if you don't set the intention and say, I have to increase the exposure pipeline, then you'll never do it. It's like anything in your life, right? I need to lose weight. Okay, now I'm going to do it. And so I think um, 
we have to be intentional about it. And I think the CISOs and the security leaders and all over the place need to start getting more aggressive about it. But I do think that people will come in when they hear that maybe there's a way to get free training mm -hmm. um, that will lead to a job. And uh, if people come for food and for money, right? Right. <laughs> like, it's true. Here's, here's some money on the table. Here's some food. And people mm -hmm. will be like, sure, like add some beer to it. Like certainly <laughs> you're going to get a party. Um, and I think we need to be doing a little more of that. But with the carrots, you know, you got to have some good carrots to incentivize people to come and find out about it. It's not gonna be right for everybody. Right. We know that. We also know that the security field is so broad and the number of jobs, you know, to really put a, a successful cyber control infrastructure in place is also incredibly broad. Mm -hmm. um, our biggest program at Lowell is actually our criminal justice program that's, yep. that's graduating a lot of people in cybersecurity through criminal justice. You know, we've gotta be thinking about that. Those are liberal arts students. They're not computer science students. Right, right. Um, different exposure pathway. Absolutely. So now the most commonly asked question, I think, of Security Weekly as a whole in the past, you know, almost 14 years has been, how do I get into information security? So what advice do you have for those that think they want to get into cybersecurity but may, you know, looking for some pathways in? Yeah. So someone, you have to go, you have to go seek out someone who's doing it. Uh, I think with anything, you got to go geek out with someone on their job. Mm -hmm. Um you know, sometimes that happens because we like someone, you know, like my mentors, maybe they weren't doing what I thought I'd do for my career, but I just liked them as people. And I was like, I just got passionate about what they were passionate about. That happens. Or it happens you seek someone out who's, you know, that's that's a cool job. I want to find out more about it. Um, I do love that, like, the National Guard is doing more exposure in the schools around mm -hmm. cybersecurity, sort of speaking that defender yep. point again. They had a cyber ranges yeah, uh, we've done some segments where they've built cyber ranges. Yeah, yeah, which is really cool. So, you know, it's one of those fields that it's not like you go to the doc. You know, we go to the doctor's office. We know what doctors do. You mm -hmm. know, we go to all these different places. We we know what people do in our daily lives when we see it. Right. Mm -hmm. Security is one of those things we have to seek out a little bit more. Yeah. Um, we have to make it easy to seek it out. Right. Um, but if we made it easier to seek out, anyone who has an aspiration to get into this field, I would say you've got to go seek out not one, but probably five different people in this field. Ask them what they do. Ask them the kind of hours they work. Ask them the kind of stress they yeah. have because we know it's a high stress profession. Well, I also like think it. that when people say I want to get into cybersecurity, they don't understand the different roles. Right. And, and like I've seen people, they've come to, to me specifically and they're like, I want to get into cybersecurity. And I'm like, well, what do you want to do in cybersecurity? Right. They're like, I don't know. I just want to work in cybersecurity. <laughs> like, what are my options? Like, they don't right. even know what the different right. options are. I'm like, red team, blue team is a really broad, overarching Super broad. Super categorization, broad. right? Like, Not there's to mention someone roles. who's trained as a lawyer. I mean, yeah. now we have accountants we're talking to and lawyers mm -hmm. we're talking to are saying, you know, I'm kind of burnt out on doing this and this. I'm saying, have you thought about doing stuff specifically in information security? It could be a really interesting pathway for you. Um, people in the medical field. You know, people in digital healthcare who are mm -hmm. doing different work, you know, you just, you ask the question, you know, do you know about this? Because there are relevancies to what, that's the point, right? There are relevancies to what you do in your daily job. Mm -hmm. So have you thought about how you might tweak your daily job and what you love to go do this on this side? Um, yeah. And healthcare tends to be very specific in cybersecurity as well. That's almost Patient like a whole. Security. It's like yeah. a whole different area, right? Like I, I think about the people I know as you kind of rattle off things like lawyers and healthcare workers. Like, there, my Rolodex is uh, if I have a question about security and how it relates to healthcare, like there's a list of people that I call because yeah. they're highly specialized in that. When I have legal questions revolving around cybersecurity, there's a list of lawyers that I call that are specialized in that. Right, right. But you may have nurses who become trained to be the floor nurse that just understands how to create a patient secure user experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a whole different layer or maybe a certification that a nurse is going to have to make sure that her patients on her floor, that their data is all secure. I mean, yeah. because we know this isn't just people hacking into systems. And this is somebody field. walking into yeah. someone's room while they're right. sticking a USB in something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, it goes beyond just, you know, I'm somewhere in a room hacking in it. It's to your point, it's so broad. There's so much to it. But I think it's on us in the security world to bring broad exposure to all those different opportunities. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you could rattle off 20 different professions in the medical field. It would be easy for you. It'd be mm -hmm. easy for all of us. It's so easy in medicine 
but it's not so easy in security and why is that sure. we have to make it easier and we've got to start um we've got to start just you know building sort of really easy dialogues with broad touch points and pathways around it awesome uh, is there places where people can go learn more about UMass or, or any of the uh, organizations or efforts you're involved in? Yeah, so um, we're currently developing, like everyone, right? We're overhauling our website. Mm -hmm. How cliche does that sound? <laughs> um, so we have a minimal amount of information on the UMass president site. Um, we have partnered with the Advanced Cybersecurity Center, um, the New England ACSE, and so they are putting a landing page together for the Cyber Education Training Consortium. Mm -hmm. Uh, to tell more about the 40 different schools that we have involved in Massachusetts. Um, I think uh, Mass Tech Collaborative has information about what's happening in Boston. You know, Massachusetts is sort of, we're, we're just building all the pieces of the puzzle to really tell a, a collective narrative. Um, but I think acse.org is probably the best place to find out um, where we're most active. Awesome. Katie, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was great. Thank you everyone for listening and watching.